Hi, good morning, everybody. Hey, uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to do something this morning. If you will go ahead and take out your phone, let's all get used to this new digital handout. So go ahead and take out your phone and go to online. You can just go to guidestone.updates.church. And the reason I need you all to do this is today is Faith Promise Sunday. And we've got a form here in a little while that we're going to ask everybody to fill out. If you go there right now, uh, whether you're in person or online, everybody has access to this. So guidestone.updates.church is our new digital handout. And then you scroll right down to February Missions Emphasis, and it says Faith Promise. You need to have that handy here in just a little while, okay? So make sure that you've got that guidestone.updates.church. All right, so... I've done my part. We're going to get back to that here in a few minutes, all right? So here's the deal. We are in the middle of this series uh, we just started last week, and now we are trying to kind of understand what God is up to through Jesus as he intersects with humanity. And so we have this God who decided to become one uh, 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 like us, one of us, and walk around like one of us. I, I tell you, some of the weirdest things are thinking about Jesus as a human being. Like, you know, somebody had to change his diapers at one point, right? And you don't, you don't think about that often, but that's the truth about who Jesus is. He was a real human being. And so we have this God who's, who came to be like us, became one of us, through his son, Jesus Christ. And I got to tell you, it's fascinating to think about as you think about how he intersects with the world. When he comes into contact with somebody, what happens in those moments? How how does God, the creator of all things, talk to a, a person? How does he speak to a group of people? What does he do to help us understand who he is? Well, how many of you guys have been to an escape room? Anybody been to an escape room? We've got three. That is incredible. All right, we're going. Everybody pack up your stuff. We're going to an escape room right now. No, I'm kidding. We're not. So what, what happens at escape? Does anybody know what, an escape, what happens at an escape room? You guys understand what happens, right? You go in there, and then you've got to get the clues, and you've got to find your way out. Escape rooms are these theme rooms where all these clues lead you to the way out, and usually you have a time limit. A, a worker at one such establishment told a story about two grown brothers and their mom, and it just immediately made me think of my mom and my brother. If we had gone out to something like this, what it would have been like, because at some point during the time, the mom had become kind of fixated on this fire extinguisher, and she was certain that the fire extinguisher had something to do with their way out. It was, it, it, there was no way around it. She knew it, and so she grabbed that fire extinguisher at the very beginning, and walked around with that fire extinguisher the entire time, really not even help, helping the brothers out at all. She kind of walked around with the fire extinguisher, looking at it, examining it, kind of checking it out. And they got to the very end. The brothers did all the work, and the mom was at the very end as she came out still holding the fire extinguisher, which, of course, made the guy at the end laugh because she's, there she is carrying this fire extinguisher from inside that had nothing to do with them getting out. Have you ever had your attention grabbed by something that distracted you from doing what you really needed to do or focus on? Yeah, we've all been there. My wife and I were driving around along the road in Oklahoma one time, and it was getting late. And I think it was a little, it might have been a little rainy too. I can't remember for sure, but we're, we're driving one way on the highway. Well, on a side road. It's, a, it's kind of a side road that leads to the highway, and we're trying to f- find our way onto the highway, and it's dark, and it's in these back roads where it's just kind of lined with trees. There's no lights just except for your headlights, maybe except for where you turn, and, and so we're kind of coming up on this intersection, and this lady at the last second tries to turn off to get onto that road, and she misses, and she slides off into the ditch and goes down the hill and ends up in this kind of little watery area and of course we stopped and we kind of turned around and we drove back and we ran down there to try to help her out and call the police it was a it was a mess but what had we we couldn't figure out what had had made her lose control of the car other than she was not paying attention she missed the intersection she was distracted by something else and she ended up down in the ditch maybe a better example for you guys who live out here in california maybe a better analogy would be this have you ever seen someone cut across four or five or six lanes of traffic just to make an exit you guys have seen that right 
Yeah, at first time, first few times I saw this, first few times I saw this, I was like, what are people doing out here? They are freaking me out. That is, of course, until I needed to do it. And then I cut across the four lanes of traffic or five lanes of traffic. And, you know, now that I've done it a few times, I no longer wonder why. You get, you know, you're in the wrong lane and you can't get over or you just aren't paying attention. Then all of a sudden you need over. Wow, it happens way too often. So, but... It's this distraction, it's this thing that keeps us from focusing on the thing that God wants us to focus on, that Jesus is talking about today. And that's what we want to we kind of check out. If you go back to that guidestone.updates.church, guess what? The sermon notes are on there. You can check those out right on your phone. I invite you to follow along uh, with those. And of course, you can go to the Bible app if you've already got that downloaded, Okay. Scripture is John 4, 46 through 54. And this is the second of the signs. In fact, we're going to see John talk about that. And remember, last week we talked about how John counted. He started counting. This is the first sign. John goes ahead and counts this one for us. It says this, starting in verse 46. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took, what Jesus, took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said yesterday at one in the afternoon the fever left him. Then the father realized this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming to Judea. From Judea to Galilee. Now, remember last week we talked about the first of the signs. It was a wedding in Cana, and Jesus turned water into wine. He was concerned with the revelation of who he was. He wants people to understand that. He said his time had not yet come, and yet he did this thing where he turned water into wine at a wedding that had so much symbolism. He was the Word who had become flesh. And remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Jesus is making a claim about who he is by turning water into wine. He has established that there is something different about him. I don't know about you guys, but you can't turn water into wine, I'm pretty sure. You tried. You tried. Some people have tried. We've tried, yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I can't turn water into wine. And, and, but j- because Jesus can, cre- because j- Jesus can turn water into wine because creation obeys creator, Right? God is not hampered by creation. God created all things, and God is Jesus, and Jesus is God. So when God said, let there be light, creation obeyed, and there was light. And when Jesus wanted the water to turn into wine, it obeyed, because Jesus is creator. Jesus and God are one. Okay, so this is the second of the signs. My mother-in-law usually has this uh, scavenger hunt for the grandkids every year during Christmas. Does anybody else do that? You guys have the little scavenger hunt for the grandkids? Well, she, she usually does this, and each year she gives them the first clue. She says, here's the first clue, and then they run around, they find the second clue and the third clue and so on. Last week, John gave us the first clue. It's like he wants us to he wants us to follow something, but this week he, he says that this is the second of the signs, and now he has showed us that, that he really is leading us some, somewhere. He does not want us to miss this. My mother-in-law only shows the kids, the grandkids, oh, only one sign. Here's, here's your sign, and we're not going to get into here's your sign. We're not going to get into all that, but we're going to get into this. Here's your clue, and once they get that one clue, then it goes on from there, but here he says this is the second of the sign because John goes a step further to make sure that we're following along before we are left to follow the clues. In other words, pay attention. We are headed somewhere. We're going somewhere. Let's follow the clues. Let's follow the signs. Don't miss them. So as we move forward over the next few weeks, let's watch and see how where the clues lead us to. 
Here in this passage, we meet a royal official. We aren't given much about him other than to say he's a royal official and he's got a sick son that's almost dead with a fever. We haven't seen much about Jesus doing miracles other than him turning water into wine. John is interested in the fact that this man came to Jesus for healing. Why did he do that? Why did he come to Jesus for healing? In the previous section of John, he walked us through several kinds of things that Jesus did after he turned the water into wine. And perhaps the, most, the, the best backdrop for what we're reading today is that he met the woman at the well. There she was. He meets her there. He, he talks her through the idea of living water. She's an outcast. She's avoiding all the other people. She comes to get water in the heat of the day rather than in the cool of the day. She's essentially an outcast because she sleeps around. Jesus talks to her about this, but his goal isn't to shame her. In fact, his goal is to restore her. Jesus has a goal to get her to believe that the living water isn't just for the good people. That the living water is for anyone who believes. And here's the thing. She believes Jesus. And this girl who avoided others by coming to get water at the well, I mean, completely, completely not wanting to see anybody, runs into Jesus and has a conversation with him and then runs back into the middle of the hustle and the bustle of the town. This same girl that was avoiding everybody now centers herself in the middle of everything to let them know what happened with her and Jesus. And they are so moved by her story, so moved by her story that they believe too. And they invite Jesus to come, and he does. And now they say they believe, because not only because she told them, but because they have met him. So they have this encounter. They have their own encounters with Jesus. All of that said, that's an incredible story. It's really, really important to us today. But there were no new miracles between Jesus turning water into wine and this man coming to ask him to heal his son. These people believed by testimony. They hear the word and they believe. I always get a nostalgic feeling flying into Oklahoma City or Tulsa um, maybe you guys have a hometown like that. I don't know. Maybe you're just still in your hometown, some of you. It, it's amazing the feelings that can be brought back when I go back to those two cities, though. We spent so much time there. And, and hometowns are funny like that. And it's, it, it isn't that I'm not home here, because honestly, I really am. When I'm, at home, when I'm at home in Oklahoma, I long to get home back here in California, mostly because it's cold there sometimes. And, and sometimes really hot and humid sometimes really windy. In fact, when I'm in Oklahoma, I just want to get back to California. This is home, but there's something about the place that you grew up. It, it makes you feel funny when you go back there. And this past week, I actually talked to a guy that I knew from college. And he and I, when we realized that we knew each other, I said, oh man, I hope you won't hold my time in college against me. You know, because you don't, you don't know. I, was I a jerk? I don't know. I don't, I don't remember for sure. And he laughed and assured me there was nothing to worry about. Jesus had an interesting time coming back to his own hometown. In this scene, the man who must have heard about Jesus was not, the, the things that must have been said, the, the things that Jesus, the, the thought that Jesus could do something had come to this man, but why? Jesus has come back after being away and says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. That's a fascinating thought. We need to see the signs and wonders this didn't come from nowhere. Obviously, people had been asking him to show a sign, maybe. Maybe word had gotten around about water turning into wine, so they thought maybe Jesus could do something. But Jesus is not comfortable with what's going on here. It seems that the people in his hometown are concerned about something other than him being the Messiah. They're concerned about the signs. And remember the mom of the two boys in the escape room that got focused on the fire extinguisher or the lady that missed her turn and ended up in a ditch or that guy that cut across all those lanes of traffic. Jesus is wanting to clarify something for us here. He wants us to understand something. His comment about not believing unless we see the signs and wonders is a statement about missing the forest for the trees. In other words, these people are getting focused on the wrong thing. They're seeing the small picture and missing the big story. 
They're becoming enamored with the signs instead of believing in the one who delivered the signs. This is what this miracle is all about. And so Jesus decides to test this man. What is he going to do? If I don't go with him, if I just tell him to go, will he believe my word? The man has an important request. Heal my son. The truth is that many of us are asking for this same request right now, aren't we? Heal my friend. Heal my mom. Heal my daughter. Heal, heal, heal my grandparents. You're, we're all praying for this in a lot of ways. Heal us, God, as a nation and as a world from COVID-19. Heal us, God. We pray this all the time. We can feel the angst in his voice. Heal my son. He hasn't come to Jesus for a sign of his authority. He's come to Jesus because he believes that Jesus is the only one that can heal his son. That's what he believes. There's no other hope. Jesus takes this opportunity again to reveal who he is. But this time he takes a different tack. The last time at the wedding he was right there. But this time he doesn't go to the boy and heal him. He's not right there. He tells the man, go and your son will live. And here's what the Bible says about the man. He took Jesus at his word and departed. He took Jesus at his word. Today and today only, we're going to look at two miracles, not just this second one, but another one after that comes after that in chapter 5 that's not, that's not counted. This is the first one that's not counted for us. The third sign isn't counted by John, but it's a sign nonetheless, and it has at its essence the living word speaking healing into existence. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15 says this, Sometime later Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored, covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him this question. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the men, man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow that you, I like that word, who is this fellow who told you to pick up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So again, we have the spoken word, right? We have Jesus speaking healing into, into existence. When God says something, creation has to obey. The man at the pool is waiting for a miracle. The pool was thought to have healing powers. Every once in a while, the pool would bubble up, and when it did, it was said that the first person into the pool would be healed. But this man wasn't trying to get into the pool. He was staying on the side. Perhaps he liked his half-life in some ways. Perhaps he didn't truly believe that the pool had healing powers. I mean, after all, he'd been there for 38 years and watched these people get in and out, and maybe it wasn't really happening. I mean, if it did, wouldn't you think he would be pressing in to get healed? Jesus asked him this peculiar, peculiar question, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Do you even want to get well? The man says, yes. And is healed. The word speaks and it is done. The pool offered this false hope, this false narrative of getting well. And yet Jesus offers something true. Jesus offers eternal life. He even tells the man, go and sin no more. Something worse may happen. In other words, you might not end up in a healthy place if you continue to live a sinful life. Jesus can provide where the world only offers false hope. 
false healing. The point is that the kingdom of heaven is for those who hear the word and believe and do what Jesus says to do. And it's a place where all things are made right. We get a glimpse of what eternity is supposed to be. This glimpse in this moment is that when we get to heaven, everything is made right. But the question is, do we want to be healed? Many of you guys know my story of saying yes to Jesus for, for being, becoming a pastor. What you might not know is that I had an indesi- in, internal desire not to be a pastor. Did you guys know that? Have I said that before? As much as I wanted to play professional soccer, and you all know that, I did not want to be a pastor. Like, those were on equal playing fields in my world. But this desire not to follow the Lord started to have take its toll on me. And honestly, it, it was a really difficult time of life. It, it was so difficult. But on the outside, it shouldn't have been. I had a job. I was getting tryouts to play soccer. But internally, it was awful. Running from God is exhausting. Have you tried it before? There's another side effect to running from God. The further you run, the more you separate yourself from the kingdom that has come. And so when you separate yourself from the kingdom that has come, you begin to live in the world. So remember, his kingdom is all around us if we're willing to see it. And that's what the healing of the man at the pool is all about. The kingdom of heaven has come through Jesus Christ. And we get to see glimpses of it. We get to see these, the, we get these tastes of what it would be like. So when we move away from him, we move away from his kingdom. But when we draw near to him, we draw to his kingdom. His kingdom which has come. And then his will can be done in us and through us as it is in heaven. I remember one day just not getting up for work. Anybody ever done that? No call, no show? Anybody? Yeah. We're going to have confession right here. We got no call, no show. I did it. I was, working at a, I was working at this bank, and it's really embarrassing, to be honest with you. I was working at this bank, and I just, I just didn't call. I didn't show up. I, I stayed asleep. I did not want to get up. I heard the phone ring. My girlfriend was calling at the time, and, and I just said, I don't, I don't want to deal with it. My boss ended up coming to my house, knocking on the door, and I didn't answer. I didn't want to deal with it. Finally, my girlfriend came by and rung the doorbell, and I got up, and I answered the door, And she looked at me and she said, what are you doing? She's in tears. Where have you been? What are you doing? And I didn't want to answer those questions. I didn't want to deal with the problems. I just wanted to be left alone like the man at the pool. The thing is, from the outside, looking in, everything was fine. Had a great job, Christian girlfriend, tryouts for soccer on the horizon, working at this bank. But I wasn't living in the kingdom of heaven. I was like the man at the pool. I knew that following the calling of God on my life was going to cost me something. And I didn't want to pay that price. In some ways, I would have to lose myself. I would have to give up my vision for myself for the future. And I knew that being a pastor would have its own trials. What I didn't know was this. As much as I thought I knew what I wanted, I had no clue what was best for me. And Jesus knew exactly what he was calling me to, and and that it was the best life for me. And here's the funny thing. As good as I thought I had it then, I've never felt again like that day that I just didn't want to get up, that I just didn't want to do anything, that I just didn't want to deal with the problems, because I started following Jesus, and there's purpose in every moment, even the hard ones. You see, at the time, I didn't want to get better. I wanted to keep my half-life because I thought I knew best. I thought God was going to get me into something less, less good, less fun, less whole. But I was wrong. I was comfortable where I was at in my relationship with God, but then I heard the word of God speak into my life. And I've never recovered from it since. I finally released my future to him. I released my identity to him. Here's the question for you. Do you want to get better? 
Trust me, friend, when the Word of God speaks and when you decide to go and do what He calls you to do, you won't regret it for a minute. The kingdom of heaven will come near. Don't lay by the pool. Get up and walk. Don't look for the signs. Look to the sign giver. I'd invite you to bow your heads for just a moment as we think about these things. And I just want to invite you to think through what it means for you. If the word of God is speaking to you and he says, do you want to get well? Obviously, there are going to be things that God wants you to give up in this moment. A false identity, something that you think you are that you're actually not. Something that you should be that you don't want to be. How might the word of God be speaking to you? Do you want to get well? Yesterday, I ran across a post on a guitar site, and there was this question, how do you get your guitar to open up? How does that happen? Is it after playing it for a long time? Is it, is it just age that it finally matures and opens up? There were all these technical answers that I heard as I read it. And then finally, at the very end, this young man says, it takes a little while for a guitar to open up because at the beginning, it still thinks it's a tree. What does God want to do in you that you're missing out on? What is his identity for you? Heavenly Father, we've come today to kind of hear from the word, the living word. God, the one that spoke creation into existence, the one who said, let there be light. We want to hear from that same being today. And that's why we gathered God, we don't need signs and wonders, although you're a provider of those things. You lead us. But God, we want to be led toward you. We don't want to be led towards the the miracles or towards the signs. We don't want to be led to those things. Let those things lead us to you. The God who loves The God who sent his only son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. That that God who does not want anyone to perish but have eternal life and offers it to whosoever believes. God, we want to hear from that God today. That's why we're here. And God, it's my hope. And our mission that everyone experiences the victorious life that's found in Jesus. And Jesus only. There's no other place to find that. But God, maybe there's some here that are, that are stuck thinking that they're trees. And you want to open them up, God. And you want to, you want to express something deep and true and right about them. You want them to play and be played. You want, them to, you want them to sing. You want to open us up like the woman at the well who maybe thought she was a tree. Maybe she thought she was just, just a sinner, an outcast. Maybe she had bought into that identity, but you told her something different. 
that the living water was for her too. God, I pray that you would that you would make that come alive in me too. That you would make that come alive in each person here and each person that's listening and watching online. That today might be a day where we believe the word about us. If there's anybody in here today that would just say, Pastor, you know what? God's working on me about something. Would you just raise your hand real quick? Would that be okay? Just raise your hand. Thank you, guys. He's working on me. He wants to make me a new creation. Yeah, thank you, guys. Anybody just say, you know what? I don't know about this Jesus character, but I would, I would love to get to know him, and I want to invite him into my heart today. Is anybody like that? Never asked Jesus into your heart before? Thank you. Anybody else like that today? Heavenly Father, we pray for these that have raised their hands right now, that you are we, are, we are trusting that you are doing your work in them, and that you'll be faithful to complete it, God. Let them know whose they are, sons and daughters of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, co-heirs with Jesus in the kingdom of heaven. Let them know it deep within who they are as you welcome them into the family as you remind them, maybe, they've been in the family, as you remind them of who they are because of whose they are. Maybe somebody would say, you know what, Pastor Doug, I'm like the I'm like the man that approached Jesus, and I've got people that I need to pray for because they are sick, they are hurting. Is there anybody like that? You just say, I'm I'm praying for somebody like that. I need somebody I need God to come and work in those people's lives. Somebody that I know is very sick. Thank you. Thank you, God. God, we're not asking you to come and, and uh, do a miracle for miracle's sake, but we do want to spend time with these people. They're our friends. They're our family. They're our coworkers. They're our loved ones. God, we pray that you would do your work. We believe that you are the great physician. So come and do your work in their bodies in their minds, in their hearts, in their relationships, and nurse them back to health. But God, more importantly today, would you heal them eternally so that we know that we will be able to see them again when this life is over. This life is so temporary, God, but we just want to know that the eternity part of it is taken care of. So give us that knowledge that our friends, that our family who are sick, the ones that we care most about, God, would you allow us the knowledge that they are with you, that they are connected to you, that they've given their lives to you so that we might see them again. Amen.